Thanks everybody for being here. I especially want to thank Dean Brock Tessman of the Davidson Honors College for the kind introduction and the invitation to speak at the University of Montana Conference on Undergraduate Research. And I especially want to thank and congratulate the uh, students and faculty uh, researchers who are here and their families. Welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to talk about uh, the research that I've been conducting in the last few years but also to talk a little bit about my preoccupations, um, certainly in the last year or so. For five years I've been researching World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars. And as you know, this war is becoming um, now a part of our history. It's, a, uh, it's growing fainter and fainter. There are no longer any living vets. We are um, having to reacquaint ourselves with this uh, momentous event in human history. And this was a great war. It was transformative, certainly, for our globe. Most of the boundaries that we know today in the modern world of the nation states uh, indeed were established um, as a result of the post-war uh, conferences. Uh, and also it's, a, it's an important war for the United States. Um, we gained a new role, a new global role as an empire, as a uh, major military power as a result of that war. And so it's important for us to look back and, uh, and revisit that war. And what I've been doing is essentially curating an exhibition for the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, an exhibition that opens in September of 2017, in which we look at the lives of uh, five people who um, were directly affected by uh, World War I uh, as a way of sort of understanding the complexity of this war, the tragedy of it. Uh, we'll look at, at four Montanans or people very closely tied to this western state and, uh, and the concept of the enemy. So the fifth entity there is an abstraction. Uh, and we'll be looking at lots of artifacts, certainly, uh, and uh, objects, photographs, memorabilia, um, personal, um, personal stuff, lots of artwork as well, that takes us very close to the lives of these, of these folks. And we'll also have a chance to look at, um, at posters, uh, propaganda imagery that was used um, widespread, not just uh, among the U.S. and its allies, but um, it's really the first, the first war in which propaganda art was used as a major weapon, an ideological weapon. And that's really what put me to thinking about uh, tonight's topic. Uh, that is, I'm going to be speaking about the nature of truth in our time. And it's posters like these that um, have made me think a lot about the nature of truth and how pliable truth is as a concept, as an, an idea. Uh, most of us believe that there is a unified truth in this world and that we can all agree if we sort of hammer through it. But the reality is that truth is easily uh, manipulated. And certainly these posters from World War I show us how the state had a vested interest in shaping the truth um, and, uh, and therefore garnering support from its citizens and also speak to its enemies uh, through both text and image. So the propaganda poster will be an essential part of this exhibition and it's, uh, it's, it's key to us understanding the way that governments uh, in fact shape and manipulate truth. Of course in the last political cycle the nature of truth has been um, uh, subject of great debate and so we'll come to that shortly. There's another reason why I'm concerned with the issue of truth, and that is that I also teach art criticism. And I often hand out to my art students this uh, handout, this sheet, in which I show on the left-hand side a list of the big categories, sort of the big, great philosophical categories. And then in the middle column, we have the promises of the modern world, how modernism has, in general, responded to these, uh, these questions. And then on the right-hand side, what you see is, uh, is postmodernism. Now, in theory, since the late 60s, early 70s, we've been living in a postmodern world. Um, so, in some ways, the contrast between modernism and postmodernism is, is essential for students to, to grasp and to understand if indeed this is, these are the values of our time. So, if you'll notice on, uh, on my screen that truth is essential to our understanding of these categories, and in fact, it's quite central to, in my chart as well. The modern world held that there was one unified truth and that it was indeed universal. There is one single way that's good for all people across culture and time. And if we work hard enough, and that is if, um, if we work through education, critical inquiry, we will in fact get to the truth. We will figure this out. 
modernism believes in this progressive notion that truth can be teased out of the mass of phenomena that we know in our world. And that ultimately what we're doing is uh, achieving a kind of utopia. If we in fact get to the truth, uh, we will in fact be living in a much better universe for all of us. But the postmodernist, the postmodernist has a radically different notion of truth. For one thing, the postmodernist believes that there are multiple constructions of meaning or reality. In other words, there is no one unified truth. The universe is relative and it's contingent. And therefore, truth is in fact created by us. It is in fact a social construct. And that meaning is always subject to negotiation in a particular context. In other words, truth shifts according to its context. History is indeed relative. And in, according to, uh, to my chart here, you'll notice that, that while progress is indeed possible towards a greater truth, there are also lots of wrong turns, mistakes, lost opportunities, lots of detours from that path to truth. So these days, the political landscape is in fact riddled with questions about the nature of truth. We talk about <laughs> truisms, we talk about truthiness, Lately, we've been talking about facts and alternative facts, as if we could basically choose which realities, which truths, are in fact viable. So there's this big distinction between truth with a capital T and the little mini truths that we see all around us, pretending, in fact, to be the truth. And I've asked myself these questions. Is truth not essential for both historical accuracy and or conducting any form of research? You're all going to become researchers someday, or you are already researchers. Is truth not ultimately what you're seeking? So in the postmodern age, is truth overrated? Is, are, are we over truth? Is truth itself as a concept over? And basically what I want is what John Lennon expressed so eloquently in his song, Give Me Some Truth. All I want is the truth. Just give me some truth. I've had enough of reading things by neurotic, psychotic, pig-headed politicians. All I want is the truth. Just give me some truth. So in this pondering, wondering what is happening to the nature of truth in our world today, I turn to, um, to this author and this uh, amazing article that I read many years ago back in the Jurassic Age when I was uh, an undergraduate. It's an article that was recently uh, brought to my attention by my friend Patrick Burke, uh, Professor Burke here at the university. And this is Hannah Arendt's Truth in Politics, uh, an article she published in the New Yorker in 1967, but one that I feel is not only relevant, but important for us to reread today. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Hannah Arendt. She was born in 1906 and died in 1975. She was a German-born Jew, a Holocaust survivor, and an illegal alien. She came to the United States as an immigrant in uh, suspect circumstances. But she became, in the post-war period, one of America's greatest political theorists. Um, I put the word philosopher here on the screen in quotation marks because it's a term that she didn't wear comfortably. Uh, she felt that the activity of the philosopher was much too antisocial, um, too individualistic. And uh, so she was more comfortable with the idea that she was indeed a political theorist. And what she pursues in this article is very much what I'm interested in knowing, and that is, quote, wanting to find out what injury political power is capable of inflicting upon truth. And certainly this, these are the questions that I've been asking in the last uh, political cycle, uh, particularly during the last presidential election. And Hannah Arendt's article is indeed full of insights about the nature of truth, not just because she was looking back at her experience with totalitarian regimes, uh, having survived the, uh, the Nazi regime in Germany and seen then the rise of totalitarian, different forms of totalitarian states in the post-World War II period. Hannah Arendt tells us that in fact truth is special and in fact fragile. Facts and events are infinitely more fragile things than axioms, discoveries, theories, even the most wildly speculative ones produced by the human mind. They occur in the field of the ever-changing affairs of men in whose flux there is nothing more permanent that the, than the admittedly relative permanence of the human mind structure. Once they're lost, no rational effort will ever bring them back. So truth is in fact fragile. Yet we think that because many of us believe in truth, that there is strength in numbers, 
that in fact we are close to truth, that we actually understand and know the truth. But Arendt reminds us that strength in numbers is opinion, not necessarily truth. Quote, the shift from rational truth to opinion implies a shift from man in the singular to men in the plural. Madison, and this is President Madison, distinguishes this life in the plural, which is the life of the citizen, from the life of the philosopher. Hence why she really didn't like the term philosopher. She actually wanted to think of herself as a citizen. And in fact, she tells us that mass culture, which she calls, quote, the domain of the marketplace, is inherently political and therefore the land of opinion, not necessarily truth. So images of presidents, politicians, demagogues, in fact, should remind us that they don't necessarily speak truth. Indeed, what they're speaking is opinion. Arendt says, quote, factual truth, so obviously in the grasp of everybody, seems to suffer a similar fate when it is exposed to the marketplace, namely to be countered not by lies and deliberate falsehoods, but by opinion. So I guess the problem that we've encountered in the last political cycle, the last presidential election, is that we've expected to find truth on that stage when we see our politicians vying for the greatest office in the land, the so-called leader of the free world. And yet, Arendt reminds us that politics is opinion, not truth. We should not be surprised when opinion replaces truth in the media or on the political stump. So the first test of this for our current president was literally the day that he took, um, that he swore, uh, he was sworn in as president. And on that day, the very concept of truth actually was on that stage, the very definition of truth. And remember, what came from the mouth, what was tweeted, in fact, by our, first, uh, by our 45th president, was not necessarily truth, obviously not truth, but rather opinion, and that's the way it should be perceived, merely as opinion. Now, when I was an undergraduate many, many, many moons ago, I believed that our first postmodern president was Ronald Reagan. And the reason for that was that, in fact, Ronald Reagan was an actor. And I, in my naivete, wondered how could an actor be a president? I mean, our presidents were lawyers, our presidents were men of letters, our presidents were scholars. And yet, here we had a person who looked great, who looked the part, and yet left us wondering whether, in fact, there was any substance behind that appearance of presidentiality. But I now know that we have recently elected our first truly postmodern president. A man who's not just a TV star or a movie star, but a reality TV star. And of course we all know how truthful reality TV is. And in fact he's an individual who's brought forth this idea that in fact news, what we hear day in day, day, in, day out of, on the press is in fact fake news and is persistent in discrediting truth. Hannah Arendt tells us that factual truth is no more self-evident than opinion. And this may, among, may be among the reasons that opinion holders find it relatively easy to discredit factual truth. It's just another opinion. Factual evidence, moreover, is established through the testimony of eyewitnesses, notoriously unreliable, and by records, documents, and monuments, all of which can be suspected as forgeries. So, in fact, the reason why we found ourselves in this dilemma where truth is questionable is because we can't trust the sources. And in fact, if they belong to the media, if they belong to politics, they shouldn't be trusted because they are indeed opinion. And yet, we, all of us sitting here in this room, know that there is indeed scientific truth. We know that truth, that truth can be vetted, can be tested, can be demonst uh, demonstrated over and over again. And in fact, when I think about the way that the media discusses, and recently we've been talking about global warming, I now understand why the detractors of uh, climate change and global warming have had the power that they, uh, they seem to possess. Quote, according to Hannah Arendt, quote, in the event of a dispute, settlement is usually arrived at by way of a majority. That is, in the same way as the settlement of opinion a wholly unsatisfactory procedure since there is nothing to prevent a majority of witnesses from being false witnesses. And that's precisely what the radicals out there who don't believe that, the, that we live in a, in a warming planet, and if indeed we live in a warming planet, then it's not man-made or man-caused. This is their argument, that in fact the entire scientific community that, uh, out, that is out there, no matter how strong, how powerful, how uh, convincing their arguments are, are indeed false witnesses. 
or opinionated witnesses. So indeed, truth is quite shaky and quite wobbly these days. And there is another problem, another category. According to Hannah Arendt, with respect to, with respect to facts, there exists another alternative, and that is the deliberate falsehood, the lie. The liar, lacking the power to make his falsehood stick, does not insist on the gospel truth of his statement, but pretends that this is his opinion to which he claims his constitutional right. And isn't that precisely what we're he hearing now from our White House? Opinion? The right to, in fact, change our mind day in, day out, from hour to hour, from tweet to tweet? The liar, quote, is free to fashion his facts to fit the profit and pleasure, or even the mere expectations of his audience. The chances are he will be more persuasive than the truth teller. And I think this is truly a remarkable age in which we're seeing the full exercise of this notion, this political idea, that in fact, liars can be much more persuasive than truth tellers. That they will in fact change the truth as they see fit to benefit their profit and their pleasure. So Arendt identifies for us the greatest danger, perhaps the most, most disturbingly, if the modern political lies are so big that they require a complete rearrangement of the whole factual texture, the making of another reality, what prevents these news stories, images, and non-facts from becoming adequate substitutes for reality? In other words, it is entirely possible that we could be caught up in a truth bubble or that the whole society can in fact be diluted by some alternative fact or some alternative truth. According to Arendt, whole nations may take their bearing from a web of deceptions. Quote, the result of a consistent and total substitution of lies for factual truth is not that the lies will now be accepted as truth, but that the sense by which we take our bearings in the real world, the category of truth versus falsehood, is being destroyed. I honestly never thought I would see an image like this in my own lifetime. Here, in these United States. So, we're left with a question. What do we do with the experience of this, quote, trembling, wobbling notion of everything we rely on for our sense of direction and reality? In other words, are we, should we be scared? Should we, in fact, be troubled by this sense of lack of direction or this wobbly notion of truth? Arendt, though, gives us some hope. She says, quote, even if we admit that every generation has the right to write down its own history, we admit no more than that it has the right to rearrange facts in accordance with its own perspective. We don't admit the right to touch the factual matter itself. Now, just as a reminder, Hannah Arendt was a modernist, not a postmodernist. She believed in a concept of truth. And I believe that, in fact, that concept of truth we must hold on to in this postmodern universe because, in fact, it will be picked at by this myriad of little truths and alternative facts. Arendt continues, there is indeed hope because truth is itself so stubborn. Quote, nowhere is it more irritating than where we are confronted with facts and factual truth. Quote, unwelcome opinion can be argued with, rejected, or compromised upon but unwelcome facts possess an infuriating stubbornness that nothing can move except plain lies. For Arendt, facts are intractable, and she talks about the unreasonable stubbornness of sheer factuality. So, I do think that there is in fact hope. In their stubbornness, facts are superior to power formations which arise when men to get together for a purpose but disappear as soon as the purpose is, uh, is either achieved or lost. In other words, political systems will come and go. Power mongers will in fact rise to take power and will lose that power. But truth will in fact survive. So what can we do now? What can we do in the immediate uh, world? Arendt tells us first we must defend the press. When your president tells you that fake, that fake news media is not my enemy, it is the enemy of the American people, and he calls it sick. We must stand up. We must, in fact, defend the truth, because that may be the only place where, in fact, truth is visible and apparent today. Arendt tells us, quote, if the press should ever really become the fourth branch of government, 
it would have to be pr protected against government power and social pressure even more carefully than the judiciary. In other words, the press is more vital even than the courts in preserving truth. And finally, to end this presentation, we must defend the university. According to Arendt, quote, these institutions, like other refuges of truth, have remained exposed to all the dangers arising from social and political power. Yet the chances for truth to prevail in public are greatly improved by the mere existence of such places and by the organization of independent, supposedly disinterested scholars associated with them. So on that note, I'll open up some questions and go Grizz!